the new year. So a very, very happy new year to you. This is Simran Balani from Bangalore, India. A big thank you to ECDF team and to Dr. Vasari for bringing us back again on the same forum, New Year, New Goals for the third year in row. And I have with me a very good uh, expert panel who will be talking about it. And some of us, we were just laughing about this uh, before we went live that we are meeting it for the third year and we had so much to talk that we literally had to had draw a pause before we go live. So maybe one of our goals is to come back every three months and just talk because I think this group here loves to talk, share ideas, from education to everything that we can think of. So a warm welcome once again, if you're joining us, I wish you a very, very happy new year. This is Simran Balani, Zonal Head with ECDF and Pedagogical Director with CC Finland, wishing you our, and your family a very, very healthy and happy new year. And today we are gonna talk about resolutions. As soon as 31st December dawns in, something happens to us we want to make resolution. Even though we would have failed in the past, but there's something inside us, or probably a pressure, an unknown pressure from peer or from the society to start this new year with new things. We have health goals, friendship goals, love goals, self-care goals, and of course, the profession that we love the most are education goals. What we are today trying to find out, what has happened to our goals in last three years, having learned something into this new normal that we are in. And there was a bit of a scare of uh, this COVID corona coming back. So how are we facing all of those challenges? What are we thinking? How are we going to plan our resolutions? And what is this new thing that we want to bring to the profession that we love so much that is education? I was reading a very nice and a funny quote that many people look forward to the new year for a new start to the old habits. So is that what we are going to do today? Or we are going to talk about something new and stick to those resolutions and what has happened to the past resolutions. So I am going to request uh, for our panelists to speak on some interesting topics, their humorous learnings, and what are they going to bring uh, to their passion, to their profession in 2023? So may I please uh, go to Ms. Barsha, uh, would you kindly introduce yourself and describe your last three years in three adjectives? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simran, and um, very warm welcome to everyone and uh, hello to people all across. Um, thank you, Simran, for inviting me over. Uh, very briefly, uh, I'm uh, Barsha and I'm the Managing Director for Perkins School for Blind. Uh, Perkins basically works and serves children with complex disabilities and visual impairment. And we are very specifically focusing on early childhood education. I think as, a, as an organization, one thing that we really want to believe, and we, that's the way we believe, and we, we feel that every child, no, ma no matter what and anywhere, can learn. And with that premise, we, you know, all our efforts are directed towards ensuring that our children should really get the right opportunity and access to both health and education. Um, last three years, of course, has been a, it's been, it's, I think it's been a, uh, a complete changeover for anyone and everyone across. Of course, I'm going to hear a lot from all the experts sitting. Uh, personally, I'm a, I'm a corporate leader who's transitioned into the education space and in the development sector, and it's been a journey full of learning. And in the last three years, uh, if I can, if I, if, you know, I was thinking that what is it that I'm really going to, you know, use in terms of the words that's kind of described our learning experience. I think um, I would say one is surreal. Yeah. But at the same time, it's been, uh, it's been extremely incredible. And I think one thing that's really changed and what that is basically, we all have got into an innovating and a solutioning mode. And I think that's what we all have done across the way, whether we work with children, whether we work with young adults or any of the spectrum. I think we all have really done that stretch. And that's been the huge learning in the last three years, especially, you know, I, I can say thanks to COVID. That's what it is. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Parisha, for summing it up. And innovative it was. We, uh, we were innovative, not only with our profession, but with our family lives and managing self. Innovation was uh, the, the key word, I think. Uh, so thank you so much for introducing yourself and uh, describing in three adjectives. I move to Ms. Minakshi, kindly introduce yourself. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and a very, very happy new year. I'm Anakshi Minoja, and I am into this education industry from last nine years. So I am, uh, I am an early educator, and I love to spend my time with this very young, uh, tiny tots. So, and I really have a passion for that. And, you know, being myself, you know, I put myself into their shoes because myself, uh, I am very lively and bubbly kind of a person myself. So yes, uh, if you ask me like, you know, the new years, every new year, we make new resolutions to complete them, to motivate us. And, you know, psychologically, you know, to work onto these goals, the new year is the best time. But yes, last three years, if I talk about, I don't know if I'm sounding it right or I'll uh, putting those adjectives right um, to these three years, the first was like, uh, it was brutally bad. So I don't know how everybody else takes it, but yes, it for me, it was brutally bad because it was like a, a black hole for me. Like, a, like all of a sudden, this uh, pandemic uh, comes in, nobody has an idea like what to do, how to do, what to do. So uh, most of us or some of us, uh, even, you know, we lost some of the souls. Like uh, many, many of us have, you know, departed from their loved ones. So it was like brutally bad for me. Then I become the that the next year becomes the learner's year for me, because now that is the new normal. So how we you know we everybody picked up their pieces. Then again they you know stood up and they uh, learned new things, unlearn old things, and how we judged all those points and you know got ourselves motivated and moving on. So that was the the next year to me. Last, you know, so last was like because uh, uh, it was a learning from the back years. So last year became, I became very flexible. So now do I know it's back of my hand. So how to give that kind of knowledge if I talk about the education sector to my children, this box became the new normal. So doing whatever we were delivering, uh, like, you know, uh, like you're managing your work, managing your home, managing your children, managing other children. So this become like you become very flexible and most of us become very flexible. So here you are talking to here and here you are just correcting your sons or your daughter's homework. No, no, this is not like that. Yes, I am here. Like, so it is like that. So the last year became like I became very flexible. So these were the three adjectives, like what I would like to, uh, you know, present it as, um, as for me, as for Minakshi. Thank you. Thanks, Minakshi. I was almost going to tell you, me too, me too. Because <laughs> for me, the first year was so terrible. I was absolutely, like, not even ready to accept. I was in a denial. And I think the second year was for me was for confidence. because yes. And learning, as you said. And now it's like, if you've just done these two things, you can now bring it on. It's like that. So yes. So now, now we, 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 we become so flexible. Like, oh. okay, now the schools are online. Okay. Bring it on. Now yeah. it is offline. Bring it on. Now you yes. have to go here. Bring it on. So it, it has become Do like that. that. Yes. That. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing those bad to learning to flexible. That's, that's probably how you would summarize your last three years. Thanks, Minakshi. I moved to Dr. Sue. Uh, welcome to the third year of New Year New Goals. <laughs> Thank you, and very happy New Year. I can't believe it's three years. Three years, yeah. Um, I actually echo a lot of what Barsha and Manachi have said in that flexible, adaptable, steep learning curve stuff. Um, it was like three years into me being an independent consultant and working from home, so a lot has happened in those last three years. And I've written down busy, varied and traveling. And when I put traveling, I don't mean actually physically traveling, because what happened the minute we had to start thinking about working in a different way during the lockdown uh, period, 
it was a lot of quick thinking. You said it meant actually flexible, adaptable. You hadn't had to suddenly start about thinking, doing training online like this. And all of a sudden, the world became the oyster. And in fact, that's how I met all of you lovely people through ECDF. All of a sudden, I was delivering training in India. I met Kathy. Um, I was working with people in Cyprus, but I wasn't actually going there. And the world became very different and a lot of new skills were learned really fast. So there's that traveling aspect. I have subsequently done some real traveling as well to do some work, which is also exciting. There's that flexibility, there's that adaptability, there's that learning new skills stuff. So busy, I think possibly a plus point of the pandemic times was actually I became a lot busier because of the different um, ways of being able to deliver different trainings. And I've made so many more new connections and new friends. So I've done a lot of varied stuff that I never expected I'd do before. So we've got busy and varied. Um, I've done a lot more work. For example, I worked with um, teachers of deaf children, which I never expected to do before. So I had to completely rethink how I delivered my work to work with children, teachers of deaf children. So the varied bit happened. Um, it, it's just been huge for me. I completely redeveloped my house, which still isn't finished, but we're not having that conversation <laughs> because the nature of having to be working from home so much more doing stuff like this meant I didn't have anywhere to sit to do it. So yeah, busy, varied, traveling, um, flexible, adaptable, steep learning curve. I know that's five, but I've added to it since Barsha and um, and actually started talking. So yeah, complete role change. Yeah, and we can talk about the construction also, no problem, because it's... <laughs> Please <laughs> let's talking. not talk about it. <laughs> All right, Dr. C. And I, liked, I really liked your point when you said traveling means not like physically traveling, but you know, virtually, we, if it was not for Corona, we've met so many people we've done so many activities or attended these webinars or learned so much yes yeah which we would have never imagined when we were doing nope. our typical nine to three schools or nine to two schools nope. or whatever we were doing because it was so confined uh, to mm -hmm. that space and coming back and doing our chores whatever we were doing so yeah well, um, and the huge audiences you get as well. I mean, yes. I did one thing at, towards the end of last year. I did, it was mostly in Great Britain, across the countries that make up Great Britain. But I had over a thousand people listening to me, which is like, whoa, <laughs> I'm glad I couldn't see them. <laughs> <laughs> but still you knew and it, yeah, it yeah. feels great. I was told at the end, would you like to know how many people were listening to you? <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that way it has been very incredible and especially mm. for us as researchers to spread our message across, tell people we have been doing that. And, you know, if, if you remember last couple of years, we've been also talking what worked well for us. Yeah. And, you know, that was one of the things that we spoke about last year, that these things have worked well for us. And maybe and when we shared those ideas, maybe somewhere someone was inspired by it. Thank you very much, Dr. Sue. Now I move to you, Shamila. Shamila, we had missed you last year, but now you are here. So. I was actually, I was actually on. I was, but I was, I had COVID, so I was. Remember saying that I oh, looked you completely. Were there. Yes, remember, I, it was my birthday, and I was completely gone. I was like, I'm gonna look really bad, but I'm coming on. But you were there, right? I were there. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> it's okay. okay. Uh, so now we have you more clear. Yes, I'm I know. Here I am. I well. Not coughing, so it's quite good. Um, I think just. I mean, I've been in early years for 24 years, long time. Um, I'm still going strong, love it. Just a complete fanatic. Um, I'm now in Dubai and I'm 22 years in Dubai. So the same thing, it's been really well. Um, but looking at the um, adjectives part, I was thinking, where do I start? You know, there's so many different adjectives that kind of supported the last three years. I did a year while I was working and there was COVID. So we were all online. It was distant learning. Then I took a year out. I needed time for my children, for me. And uh, in the past, we'd see it as a career break. But I think with the COVID situation, it was never really a career break. It was more having looking at all the different opportunities. So we, it was it became resourceful. 
So we looked at all the different ways we could connect. I came onto the forums here. I wrote my first children's book. I came online with all, so many different training programs. So it was never a career break. I guess it was inspiring as well. So for me to be able to look at all the different ways that I can keep on going by sitting behind a screen or sitting behind my desk at home, maybe not in the situation that we're so used to being at work, but still being able to keep going with the passions that we that I had. Then I came back into work last year. So a year in, a year out, and then a year in. And then it's just become so dynamic now. So we kind of, we're support, we can, we know how we can support each other. We know if anything happens, we can get right into that. As um, uh, Man actually said, is we jump right into it. And we know if that does happen, we're not going to have that panic that we had before. We're able to say, okay, now this is how we manage this. We learned from, I remember coming onto this forum with you guys, Simran, and we were saying what worked well for us, what was challenging. And I think because we had that chance to connect and support each other and reflect as we were going through the systems we were going through, if God forbid we had to go through that situation again, we would be able to come towards it in a bit more of a, um, in a clear way without panicking each other, with more support, with more, um, approachable and more accessible uh, ways of dealing with things uh, so I mean for me I think it was just a journey back and forth and then knowing that if we, we survived it we did and we did it together we connected yeah um like uh, like um Dr Sue said we never really connected never knew each other but it was actually this forum that brought us together. So it was really nice to see you all again. I remember saying, oh, I missed you guys. And that's where we said, you know, we need to meet more often because it was really nice. So there's a whole lot of different adjectives that we can put to the last three years. Thank you so much, Shamila. And I think um, we have all, once again, ECDF, a big thank you to ECDF because it fueled in so much of energy in the last two or three years for us and they were uh, you know picking up the pace giving us our own timelines and yet we were coming together and you know uh sharing and shining bright thanks to them you know we had some place to dress up and show up so a big gigantic but even though we're wearing probably pajamas <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> at least we knew, we look, here. it was really good <laughs> yeah at least we knew we had to look presentable for the upcoming <laughs> webinar of the cdf and they Agreed. gave us a lot of um, what do you say, that energy, you know, that, oh, I need to prepare for this. I need to be out there. I need to talk about these things. In, and uh, also, I, I think adding that we we were not alone in the boat. It was yes. it was a forum where we all said, ah, oh, hang on, you're also going through it. Yeah. Thought, okay. So how do we manage it? So it was like a huge support system. Yeah. Yeah. And even now when um, Barsha said all the things that she was talking about, and uh, sorry, Meenakshi said, uh, I was like, oh my God, this is what I felt. So these kind of forums are just kind of reinstates that we are okay. We're not like hallucinating or something, we are fine. <laughs> Anyways, thanks, Shamila. And I move to Claire. I welcome Claire. Uh, and uh, can you introduce yourself? And floor is yours. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. And I hope it's going to be a most amazing year for everybody because I think we actually all deserve a fantabulous one, don't we? Um, so I'm Claire Stead. I'm the creator and founder of the Aliki app, which is an app for parents from conception to two to build babies' brains. But it's also for nurseries to support their parents um, to become baby brain builders so that the kids coming in are more ready and receptive to the amazing playful learning that you will be giving your children. Um, so my experience of the pandemic is a bit different to everybody else because I've been working online for 20 something plus years. So welcome to my world everyone, yay, because my first word is connection because it's been a bit lonely and on my previous role where I put the whole of primary education on a tablet for African kids to get international standard education in their own language, I employed people around the world and one of them was a lady called a Little Pink Pebble. Now I have never seen Little Pink Pebble and all the other people I employed. And if I walked down the street, I wouldn't know who these people were, but yet I was daily chatting to them on Messenger through Skype because no one had that internet connection that was strong enough or good enough. And we didn't have these amazing tools like Zoom. 
And, and I remember looking at one guy who had the coolest name and he was an artist. And I thought, oh, I know what he looks like. He's like this reggae guy. He's got like dreads. I knew who he was. And I looked him up. He's completely different. He's a white, skinny um, American guy from Florida. <laughs> different vision I had in my mind so it's beautiful to have made my first word is connection because I have made some amazing real friends through this journey and um which leads me beautifully on to my next one which is learning and I have learned so much from these amazing people that I've met around the world experiences that you all have and we all have a tiny nuance of, 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 of specialty that we can cluster together and and I feel like my brain has like grown and exploded through the year where my initial thoughts um, about what I had been doing, which was making this first thousand days really real for parents and really get parents to understand their amazing role in their children's deliver, um, development. Um, it's been so enriched by the learning I've had from other people's tiny uh, niches as well, because then I've connected new things to my initial thought process. And so I thank all those amazing connections I've made over the years, of which you are a large part of that, um, for the, 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 the gift of the learning that you've given us, um, and particularly me, which has led to my third one. Oh my goodness, I should be a radio presenter. Um, the, you know, it's going through, um, uh, which, is, which is growth. And, and I feel that I've grown. My learning has grown, my, my um, connections and my social environment has grown. Um, my, my development has grown, but actually so has my business. And um, I've got nurseries using my app around the world. And it's exciting to watch that development happening because the power of um, getting these things into the hands of the people that can make the biggest difference by giving parents support, we transform our babies' lives. And those tiny, tiny people that we, uh, we were talking about before have amazing outcome. And that's after all what this amazing early years um, group of people, and what a group of people, because, you know, I've worked in primary all the way down and I, early years, you're a special group. You're gorgeous. And I think we should cherish ourselves because, you know, so I'm sticking in a third one. Fourth one, cherish. So there we go, that's me. Thank you so much, Claire. And yeah, you can, I mean, you should consider being presented. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, yeah, and I think growth is a very powerful word there. We all grew emotionally, uh, mentally. We became more stronger, more resilient. Mm -hmm. I think a big thanks to the whole support system or whatever we were exposed to, even though we couldn't step out of our homes. Thank you so much, Claire, for that. Thank you. Dr. Katrin, a warm welcome and a happy new year again. Kindly introduce yourself and the floor is first. Hello, everyone, and it's so nice to be with everyone again. And as you've all sort of um, mentioned, it's so nice for us to come back together as a group, but also to everybody who's listening and watching too. It's um, it's always joy. It's always a pleasure. And gosh, what what can I add to everybody's <laughs> wonderful descriptions of the pandemic? Um, I'm Dr. Catherine Murray, and I'm from Australia. And I'm the founder of Future Strong Education, and I'm also the creator of Brain set environments, um, and that's about aligning the brain. So, a bit of a synergy with Claire and also with Sue. Um, it's uh, about aligning the development of the brain, the child's brain, to the environments that we set up in our early learning spaces, so that we can support their learning in a in a really engaged, uh, playful way. But we're looking at brain development as as well as all of the other developmental domains that, of course play a, a large role in our planning and our designing of our environments. Um, and that was developed, BrainSet was developed during this pandemic. And I guess because I had time to do some reading, I did some research and all of these ideas that have been floating around in my head for 40 years all came together uh, and uh, BrainSet was born. And over these last couple of years, it's uh, it's um, I've shared it with the world I guess which is uh, a big step and I felt very vulnerable about that having to, to share just something that I thought was a good idea um, based on my own experience and a whole stack of research uh, but it's been accepted uh, really well uh, across the world and now it's my great pleasure to be able to train people um, in all, all parts of the world both online because that's the way we all had to do it 
um, and now face to face. So that's sort of nice too. So I'm in America now doing just that. Um, and Sue is part of my team too. So, you know, together we we um, spread the word about uh, brain set as, as well as one of our, our other team members, Kavita Tanner. So, she, you know, we together, we, we do all this across the world. So that's developed over the last couple of years, which has been very exciting um, around that. So I guess my words were uh, very much like uh, Claire's actually. Uh, interesting connections is what I what I uh, wrote down as my first one because uh, like Claire, I've made a stack of connections and um, earlier, uh, no, earlier last year, I came to America and I actually met some of the connections like face-to-face, -face, sat down, had a glass of wine or had a meal or something with people that I only knew via uh, LinkedIn or Zoom or some other, you know, online process. And it was so lovely because I already thought I knew them. They are already my friends. But then when I actually sat in the same room with them and um, we connected on a more physical sort of level, you know, being in the same place, uh, that just um, deepened the relationship. And, and now we're strong friends. Uh, and it just brought home to me how important that connection is and building relationships with people is and yes we can do it online but I'm very much looking forward to one day actually being in a room with all of you guys and and actually talking to each other and you know laughing and joking as, as we do online but it's a little different when you're in person. So um, the next word that I sort of thought about was resilience because some of the things that I tried to do didn't work so well, you know, business wise, and also personally, you know, with my own family and um, resilience was a hard one. And, and I was in Australia. So, you know, we couldn't travel anywhere and Australia is remote, as you know. Uh, and the only thing we can do to to see different parts of the world is travel for a long time. Um, and I couldn't travel, couldn't do anything. So I felt like my, my hands were sort of cut off because I couldn't travel anywhere within Australia or out of Australia. So I had to um, manage that um, and manage the ups and downs of business and the ups and downs of family coming and going, people being sick, uh, a range of different things as we all had to do. So I think resilience is a word that I would like to use. And as we sort of got used to the, the ways of covid um, it became quite peaceful, I think, because there wasn't so much traffic on the on the road. People were at home more, and I actually got a sense of peace. Um, very sad to see uh, the sickness and um, the passing of a lot of people across the world, but it was uh, it sort of seemed like the world got quiet. Everyone was quieter. There wasn't as much pollution. The ocean seemed to be cleaner. Um, and I was just at home. I didn't have to rush around in the morning and get ready to go out somewhere. I was just at home doing Zoom sessions, as, as, as um, we've said before, with pajama bottoms on and just, you know, just lipstick and do your hair and you, you're good to go. So um, peaceful is my third word. So thanks, Simran. Thank you so much, Enya. It was um, peaceful inside and out both because we didn't have to rush. We were trying to go to the calls from one screen to another, but still it was kind of very peaceful. We were not rushing around in traffic. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we got more stronger. That, that, that's true. And we were ready to take more like plunges, as we say, and see what happens, test the waters. So Dr. Kathleen, thank you very much. I move to Sukaina Hussain. Uh, can you introduce yourself and the floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and good evening. I'm Sukhana Hussain Ibrahim, and I'm from Pakistan. So uh, basically, I'm working as a clinical director at a trusted support therapy clinic. We are working with the children who are in spectrum. So basically, there's no age limit, but of course, the early years are involved. So though it's quite tough and people ask me, how do you feel? I said, I just feel very heavy when I'm back to home. It's It's really not easy to deal with them and see their meltdowns, this stage where the parents are crying in front of us. So basically the uh, services we provide are occupational therapy and speech therapy and ABA. I myself is a remedial therapist along with uh, recently passed my RBT exam. So I'm registered behavior technician as well. Uh, I'm a teacher trainer with a well-known organization in my city, Karachi, that's IBA. And uh, I'm working on Lego and art as a healing and cognitive tool. 
So if you talk about uh, 2020, the adjective I would like to use is positive. Because all the time, we all were trying to be positive, support each other, try to avoid any negative thought, try to be focused. Uh, I mean, bring more energy to our lives, though we were not connected, but our positivity more towards like cooking for our family, involving our family, and trying to like connect with the people, who, those we were not connected with. So yes, I mean, not losing our track and not losing our hope that was 2020 for me then of course we were heading towards 2021 again the ups and downs the closing of schools closing of malls closing everything opening and closing so that was a year which i thought was the year of enlightening for me uh adjective enlightening suits here because uh, what we all went through we never thought about it Though the pandemic was always always there in each and every century, but of course it wasn't widespread. Maybe because of the uh, commuting, the traveling was not so common. And it was of course there this time. So enlightening was a light word which I would love to describe. Then I picked a few courses. I was connected to the people across the world. So of course the knowledge was there. So it was a year of enlightening for me, the attractive. Then 2022 is educative and acceptance because I joined this trusted, uh, that clinical director as a clinical director. So my all, or you can say the effort towards the acceptance for them in the society. So they can be warmly welcomed. You know, uh, I belong to Asia. So we don't have much acceptance in our society, in our country. So my all work is towards the acceptance for the little, the hidden gem. So they can come with more power and giving power to their families and their parents and uh, do something which is really, really very different. So yes, 2022, it's acceptance. Uh, now I'm waiting for 2023. Let's see by February, maybe I'll be able to find any new objective for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we can save it for our uh, hopefully quarterly meetings or the, the one that we will have next year in 2024. Thank you so much uh, for sharing all of this with us. So as uh, we wrap this round, if there are viewers who are joining us now, once again, a very warm welcome to this webinar, which we're doing third year in row. A uh, big thank you to ECDF and Dr. Vasavi. So this webinar is New Year, New Goals. And what we have been talking about is how would we describe the last three years in three adjectives? And we've got really, really nice comments and nice experience that our panelists have shared. I think for me personally, the one word that is popping up is hope. I was hopeful each day when I woke up and when the world was coming around me, because as uh, Inakshi said, we were not ready to accept in the first year, but then there was a hope to log in, to be interactive with somewhere, someone out there in the world, do some research. I couldn't have even imagined of doing the courses and uh, going towards the higher education if it was not for these. So I think hopeful and um, treasuring life because life became so precious and it was like it is just now. And that's where the word for me was taking the plunge, taking the risk. So it has been quite an experience. We have matured, we have grown, we have been rebel. We have uh, cried like babies at times, and yet we have emerged stronger. So uh, kudos to all the panelists. And now we move to our round two, where we will talk about achievable goals of 2023. Now that we have this experience, good, bad, ugly, nice, whatever it is, and the world that is uh, welcoming us with this experience, what do we see as the achievable goal for 2023? So we start with Varsha, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so, uh, so much, Simran. And um, it was really interesting to hear all the pa panelists share their thoughts. Uh, so very briefly, you know, um, as I said that um, I work with an organization which is working for children with disabilities and visual impairment. And uh, personally, I'll kind of keep it to you know the way we envisage and what we want to do in terms of our children and I think our goal actually remains the same you know Perkins School for Blind 
just has one goal and that's what we continue to do year on year uh, without a miss is basically our um, endeavor is to create a world where every child can learn, uh, you know, and it includes all the 240 million children who are there, you know, in the world with disabilities. And of course, our goal is not really new. So if I can say it's it's almost like a hundred year old, um, you know, and our, our entire innovative pedagogy that we have developed, you know, which is in our Watertown campus, uh, we just a desire to share that with people across the globe. Um, having said that, um, you know, one of the things that we're really looking at is that, you know, everybody today is talking about um, uh, foundational literacy, talking about numeracy, right? And um, one of the things that we're really talking of is that that's the middle of the bell curve because, you know, it's so much easier for you to really track children who are learning, who are learning in school, all right? But learning happens way before you a child gets into school. Uh, and we, we do talk of early childhood education, which is birth to six years, but it's zero to three years, which are those learning years that we also need to focus. And somewhere I think um, every time that I've spoken in India to a lot of funders, to a lot of um, you know corporates, I think they just want to see, you know, have the children learned? Can the children really, you know, spell three letter words? And, you know, one of the things for us is also to, uh, you know, apart from the fact that making sure that you are making uh, education, quality education accessible, we also want to talk of an equitable and inclusive world and a world where every child belongs. Having said that, the other thing that we want to focus as a goal is that can we really bring on awareness and the sensitization of people uh, towards children with disabilities, you know, so many times that I go and talk to people, they say, you know, we are, we are not in that sector. And I say, you know what, whatever that you pick up, whatever work that you do, disability cuts across. So therefore, I think, you know, the other thing that we really want to really focus on is that uh, can we as individuals, can we together as organizations really, uh, really reduce the gap, you know, between exclusion, inclusion, and quality education. And that means really focusing on our early childhood education, because without that, you will never have your vocational education. You know, we're talking about employment. We're talking about, you know, those uh, 15 year olds, but look at the kind, because there's a huge amount of um, children who are deprived of that education, which is really the pre prep to learning. And for us, that continues to be our learning goal. And uh, we've come a long way. And I think uh, uh, despite the fact that, you know, pandemic had hit, I think our, our community interventions didn't stop. Our engagements with parents didn't stop. Our engagement with the community just didn't stop. Uh, so as uh, you know, all of you said that we just found different ways of innovating. I think for us, we just need to figure out ways of making sure that people across the, uh, you know, the sector, which is your corporates, your funders, your uh, you know, leaders, your policymakers, can they all understand that it's not always the middle of the bell curve, but maybe, you know, we need to move beyond. So that's what is for us continues to be our learning goal. Awesome. And uh, wishing you all the best in making sure that you get this alignment of exclusion, inclusion, and quality education. And as we say, equity, which is the most important thing. And wishing you all the best for this uh, goal and hopefully it is an achievable goal and um, and it is a good way of also spreading the message a kind of sometimes when we're having these conversations a lot of time I'm asked why the webinar you know and you know you're talking about something and then it is all forgotten perhaps yes but now that you have sent this uh, uh, sentence to us it registers in our mind and sometimes when we are drawing out the policies or we are in part of a decision making we remember this that we need to be a part of this bigger goal. So thank you so much, Barsha, and wishing you all the best. Dr. Sue, over to you for your goals. Thank you. Well, you may have noticed that I gave Barsha a round of applause then, <laughs> because actually you've just said it all. And I noticed Claire nodding sagely as well. There was a lot in what you just said that is a lot of what is wrong in England too. <laughs> um, so my goals, are um, moving people away from the idea of fancy pants stuff. And by that, I mean 
buying into a program of learning that promises to do something, buying a load of resources that promise they will do something else, um, printing a lot of things off the internet and sticking them all around the walls because apparently they will magically do something. Now, I've spent most of my life so far trying to move people away from that, but I will keep going. Um, and that leads into exactly what Barsha just said, moving people away from the idea that there is a normative child. Because the pandemic hit at a very interesting time for us in England, because we were about, we were dealing with the first draft of a new early years framework and all sorts of bizarre things happened and there was a perfect storm of everything clashing because people were not necessarily working in their normal ways because of pandemic there was a new framework hitting all sorts of poor information was escaping onto the internet because all sorts of people had found that they could use zoom and webinars and sell things if you like so we've had a perfect storm of loads of misinformation coming out and what we are now dealing with and i suspect claire will have noticed this is exactly what you've just said Barsha. this whole thing about phonics and when you're age four on your first day in one of our reception classes you need to be able to hold a pencil and you need to be able to sit and write well no you don't um, because actually you might not be physically ready for that. You might want to be rushing around and climbing trees. So there's a lot of huge conformity happening with the idea of a normative child. And we have age-related expectations, A-R-E. Well, any of us who've ever met a small child will know that there's no such thing. <laughs> because a, one two-year-old could be doing this, another two-year-old could be doing that. I've got four grown up sons and there are certainly no age related expectations for them. I've now got a six month old granddaughter. So she's like my kind of, oh, so she's doing that now. And, but things have changed since I had my boys. She's, she's only just started weaning. But when I had all my grown up boys, they weaned at four months. Well, she's six months and that kind of thing. So very much with Barsha on that one. Thank you. Um, so move people away from fancy pants products to solve problems. Use move people away from the normative child idea. And I'm picking up um, something beautiful that Sukena said about accepting the hidden gems. Thank you for that. Because every single child, whatever their differing ability could be, has knowledge and has things to share, however they choose to share them. And I think that gets missed too. And since pandemic, when obviously children were leading different lives, and we have now three, four, five year olds who've not known anything really quote normal. Um, I don't know what normal is supposed to be, mind you, but and I've got scores of teachers who I read on social media saying my children won't sit and listen when I try to do my hours worth of phonics with them or my half hour of <laughs> sorry uh, my half hour of this or my children are four or five years old but they're not doing what it says in the guidance well remember the word guidance it's not actually child development um so yeah it's all of that stuff except the hidden gems i think that's going to be my third one it's not quite what i was going to say but so move people away from fancy pants stuff move people away from the idea that there is a and I'm going to do the air quotes, normative child, and keep preaching to people that actually every single child that comes across your threshold as an educator has something to offer you, which is how I ended up with a child saying to me once, I want to know how water makes electricity. Well, that came from left field. Children know stuff, don't they? Yep, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suman. I love that. Um, and I noted that take away the conformity that the child at this age in this class on this particular day is going to do that. The whole lesson plan thing for me um, 
just don't. I mean, I'm, I'm, an end, I'm an end of August birthday. So effectively, all the way through my school career, I'm pretty much a year younger than everybody else. And at my great advanced age now, I think that still makes a difference. Yeah. So I, I kind of go back to my teachers when I was speaking, especially the early years. And I say, mm. do not worry about the syllabus or the lesson plan. Look at what they are coming with on that day. And if you nourish even those half of those things, the day is well spent in school. But people are scared now. They won't do that because they have to do this much phonics, this much math. Exactly. This much and that is, else. So then that is what the thing is, I think even with parents, uh, the programs that I'm doing is trust your teachers because they are the ones who are getting trained into the innovation of early years. They are the specialists and they have the common interest in between. So here is the parent, here is the child. I mean, here is the teacher, here is the parent, and that's the child. So we have that interest for the child. Do not worry if they're not holding the pencil at all. Oh. Or, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, for early year educators, especially, we have spoken about this before, and I'm glad we are touching upon this. And the ones who are passionate would say, please, let's just move away from this as soon as possible. And I think it is up to the teachers, the facilitators that we work with to believe in themselves. Uh, it's really that. hard though, in this country at the moment, it's almost impossible because we have people up the top with big names and government who say, but they must be doing this, we must be doing that. And then we have a prime minister who announces this week that he wants to insist that everybody continues with their mathematical learning until they're 18. Well, that would have been the end of me. I can't do maths. Yeah, me too. I can't do maths. <laughs> um, I suspect Claire might have something to add to this. I've just completely forgotten, and I should remember her name, the lady, the physical lady that you were mentioning just now. Charlotte Davies. Thank you, Charlotte Davies. And all of her physical stuff and her work around understanding the physicality of young children and how it impacts their learning has to be read. And unfortunately, we have a lot of powerful people in this country, I'm only speaking about England, who completely miss that point and say that, oh, you know, three year olds should be sitting at tables writing their names and things. Well, no, they can't. Some of them maybe might be able to start being interested in that because they've had all those physical experiences. But after two years where they're very early part of that was spent in lockdown and they couldn't go to parks and climb trees or use stairs or whatever. Anyway, I could rant for hours about this and it's somebody else's turn now. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sue. And maybe we will have one a webinar and I'm, that is going to be my goal where we talk about the real time innovation in early years and how to implement them. Because implementation is where everything gets missed. You know, I, I Again, my biggest belief is it's not about the courses that we take. It is not about the certifications that we flaunt. It is about the implementations that we take to the classrooms each day, day in, day out. That says what kind of educator, uh, teacher, uh, school leader we are. If it is not implemented in the classroom, we have not activated the student agency. We have not nurtured their learning. No matter what we get into these courses is of no use. And uh, as she, as Dr. Sue very nicely said, uh, no matter of ready-made resource that I have put very beautifully in my classroom is going to do the job if I do not let my little ones explore the physical environment and have to make them write in the notebooks. Anyways, yeah, we definitely need a webinar on that. Nice lead in <laughs> for Kathy there as well. <laughs> Yes, so thank you so much, Dr. Sue. We move to Shamila. Shamila, thank you for your patience while we digressed a bit. Um, over to you with the new year goals. Thank you so much. No, it was really nice to listen to everything everyone had to say because we reminisced. I think all of us were nodding and kind of in agreement with everything that was being said. Um, and then that leads me to uh, my, my kind of goals that I had in mind, work-related and personal-related. I mean, working with the teams that we work with. I think last time we were on, we were talking about how we supported our teams uh, that we work with while they've been at home. And now that they come back into the settings, um, what's their expectations? Again, I'm going to do the air quotes. And I think there was an article I read some time ago in, uh, that was actually published in the UK and saying, 
nurseries playing catch up. And my heart just fell and thumped up to my throat. And I thought, what? Get catch up? As in, we've got, had this gap. And all these teachers are stressed because their expectations from them for their children to be at particular stages by a particular time in a particular way were so highlighted in that teachers are saying, look, we're having to play catch up and the depression and the anxiety that came with that. And the fact that teachers would say, how are we supposed to do that? And I could see the panic. So one of my goals would be is to kind of retract and sit with the ladies and say, look, guys, it's okay. And we're not filling in any gaps. We're not trying to play catch up. We're just doing what we do best. And we'll continue to do what we do best. And we've, we kind of, we're embracing the change. We have been through a huge change in the operations of things, in the dynamics, in the personal situation of things. We know that we can adapt to change. We're embracing that change. And with that comes the resilience to be able to kind of pace ourselves and not expect too much from each other. So just, I think one of the goals would be, was, it will be to kind of touch base and say, it's okay because I see the stress. I see the worry. I see parents saying, but why doesn't my child do this? Why isn't my child holding the pencil correctly? Why? But I think we need to educate. And then that will lead me to the next one is educate parents as well. So I do, I'm trying to look at a way that I can bring up a forum similar to this for parents who are worried, who have um, kind of, and they're comparing the, the older siblings to the siblings that have gone through the pandemic. And that's a huge thing for me because they'd say, but my child, he's what, he's 10 now, he used to do this at this age. But then I think bringing to the table that your child now that we're talking about has gone through a different era that your older child did not go through. So I think bringing awareness to the table to the teachers, it's okay. And then again, to the parents that we deal with every day and saying, it's okay, it will be okay. Please stop comparing because there's lots of comparisons going on. There's lots of kind of rush to say, why is my child not speaking? Why is my child not doing this? And that's where when Bursha, the likes of Bursha, the likes of Dr. Sue, Claire, you all kind of jump in and you support the practitioners. And we as leaders, the nursery managers, nursery leaders, we need your support to be able to say, look, guys, it's OK. Such and such are saying that side of the world, that side of the world, it's happening everywhere. And we will get there eventually. So, and then, so it would be the parents and the children. And then again, I brought in one of my achievable goals as well, because I know that we're in situations in early years, but I think if I, I'd like to work on my, um, so, so we had my, when my husband did say to me, he said, being busy isn't a flex. And I said, you're right. So being busy, I just want to be able to say, no, this time is for me. So kind of being able to have some self-care put in there, because we, I think up until we reached COVID, it was all about the world rushing around, doing what is right for everyone else around us. But when we came to the COVID and especially lockdown, when the streets were empty, there was no traffic on the road. There was no way to even get to the local corner shop to pick something up. It was all about making, um, making the most of what we have with us in our houses and then with the family members that we have. So I think self-care and kind of just pacing and stepping back and saying, I don't need to rush into that right now. I can take a step back and I can be with my family and I can say no because it did work before, so it can work again. Um, so those are my three uh, achievable goals, I hope. Superb. And I'm <laughs> so glad that you have kept your personal goal also. And self-care is such a big one right now. Um, as I was saying that, you know, we've just kind of realized that life is short. And this is the time it's always, for us, it has always been, okay, let me do this later. I'm going to take a solo vacation, maybe later. So everything has been pushed to later. So great, all the best to you. And I love that you said, we need to say to each other, it's okay. I get it. Even if we were to say that to our colleagues, to our mentors, even to our leaders, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sharmila. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry with my throat. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so I work in a thousand days. I'm only interested at the moment in a thousand days and I've really specialized down for a reason because those are such fundamental 
thousand days and they start from conception then they go to two and all the stuff we're talking about is built on that foundation that is created during that period of time but we all know well no the science is getting better known but it's not in general knowledge and going back to what to do, Dr. Sue said, get rid of the fancy pants. We, we need to go back to the basics. We need to go back. And I think my first objective is to get help, help people. Um, and I mean people globally, like as in not globally around the world. Well, yes, globally around the world, but globally in all areas and walks of life um, and in our roles in everyday life is make play the developer and the driver. So if we allow the play to drive the learning and not stop when they are four or five because we're putting them in school, but making play the driver throughout the curriculum until they're 18 and leave school. And then when they get to university, make play the driver because we have this amazing thing for play that we use to help us learn but we learn in an engaged way when we play we learn what we need to learn when we play and we need know we learn the skills we need in order to be able to facilitate the play so i really want to help that become my big banner of the year um that that we're making play the driver and the developer of our children from inception and that sounds bonkers but we need to help play be the developer of our parents and our children from that earliest stage because when a child is being grown in the nine months of being grown we're also growing parents yet we don't do anything with with that period of time and I really 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 want to bring that to the forefront of everybody's knowledge and and thought process and how do we do that well there's lots of ways of doing it Aliki is one of those ways it really supports parents from that first conception right the way through until their child's two and puts these beautiful foundations in place that then can be built on in the nursery um which which makes me brings me to my next one is I really want to help nurseries see that their role is in supporting parents to help their child children arrive at their successes yet parents are not trained. We don't give parents the support they need. We, in a, in a, a research study done um, by the Royal Foundation during lockdown, there was the most horrendous um, uh, statistic that came out of that report. 70% of parents with children from zero to five feel judged. 70%. Now they feel judged about their child's discipline the things they do with their children, how their children are behaving, um, it, how they interact with their children. All of that in my world is because they don't understand their role in how to help their child develop, which is what Aliki is all about, helping make that happen from the earliest of days so that you amazing um, early years people can build on these fantastic foundations that have been put in place by parents and the parents can continue now they've got that knowledge grow and develop as the child grows and develops so that you know we know that children are only in school but they're at home 20 80 percent of the time even if they are in full-time care so the main educator of these children is our parents so why are we not putting them at the heart of our education i want to shout that loud and be quite sort of Possible about that one. And then the next one that I really, really, really want to do, and um, Mrs. Big Corporate Pants is out there, I'm talking for you. Um, if you are head of HR, if you're head of wellness, what are you doing to support your newly pregnant families who come and visit you and say, I'm pregnant? I want to change that conversation from, ooh, fantastic. What are we going to do about that project while you're off? Who? That's fantastic. I want to give you a gift that will last with you and help you feel confident in your parenting from the outset of your journey in parenting because I care. We as a corporate care. And the reason that we as a corporate care is because we care about the society that we are creating and our future employees and you as an employee, employee now, because if I care for you from the beginning, 
right from the outset of that journey, I will get back a much more confident, much more cherished worker in this journey that they are on. And, and yes, the answer, as far as I'm concerned, is that we give parents a leaky from the, that first conversation as a corporate, that we do say, we actually care how you are navigating this period of time, which is a massive transitional time for parents. And often in a corporate environment, they're the only one going through it. There's no one to hold their hand and go along with them. So why are we not giving this beautiful, tiny gift of loveliness where we celebrate successes on a daily basis, cherish our workers so that they can cherish and nurture their children's success so that when we get them in the early years, we can take that and let them flourish and fly and, and go out into the world and do the sparkles that they're going to be and share that sparkliness with our world. I just think it's, I, I, it's bonkers and I want to change it. Amen. <laughs> Claire, I really like this whole new vision of uh, corporate care. And I have a got background back in HR and talent acquisition. And yeah, the first reaction is, great. What about the project? We do say that. So, but I mean, and it is a part of the job, right? To manage the time mm -hmm. when the person is gone. But if it was to say, you know, this is our support system while you are going yeah. through this pregnancy. And this is for fathers too. Why only mothers? Absolutely. You know, my wife is pregnant. Okay. Well, how much time would you need off to be with her? That is what the policies we are making. Or, you know, even when the child is, it's just like zero to two years. There are so many times these parents want to stay back home, take care of the little ones. And now that we are into this whole online mode, what can companies do? But what I liked about you is that the first thing is to actually show them we care and then bring in the, the, the formalities and the planning that is a part of running any corporate. So yes, uh, and- It totally changes the conversation. Sure. And when we change that conversation, we change that nurture. And that's yeah. what companies are now seeking to do around the world, but they don't know how to do it. This is a really incredibly simple way to do it that is effective and scientifically proven to be successful. So why wouldn't yeah. we do it? Yeah, and it also it can also lead to a greater employee engagement, saying Absolutely. that my company actually cares, just not has these fancy little advertisement somewhere in the cafeteria. So yes, yeah. and I love play the developer and the driver. And, you know, even when I have done sessions with corporates, the moment I tell them, do you want to hear a story? And even the ones who are at the leadership level, they say, yeah. So <laughs> that way can go a long way. And I'm sure there is, I, I read somewhere of how corporates are using storytelling to, you know, do their training sessions more interesting, correct? So play from zero to 18 is like it's yeah. like an amazing amazing idea out there what i'm interested in to see who are the bravest and who is the one that's going to stand up first and say i'm in you know yeah. that's the corporate that's brave that's yeah. the corporate that's driving this change and I, it's a challenge who's who who is it going to be contact me well, I hope you get the contenders with your achievable goals. All the best to you, Claire. I move to Dr. Catherine. Uh, kindly share your goals. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, um, as I was listening to some of the concerns and some of the goals and, and hopes and dreams of, of the speakers so far, I was ticking off the ways that I know that BrainSet can help in classrooms and how that supports that supports families, it supports the teachers, it supports the children because we're aligning everything with the needs of the brain. So um, we're talking about accepting children for who they are right now, right here in front of us. BrainSet does that because no matter what ability level you have, you can you can be engaged in the defined little learning spaces that we develop, you know, with, with some support and guidance. We, we develop lots of different little learning spaces within our environment. And, and that that um, fulfills the needs of, of, of the children. And because the children are grouped in smaller little, little spaces a, a, across the environment, the teacher has more opportunity to work with with individuals or pairs or you know little groups of three children so you get to know the children a little more right here in front of you right now so when we're looking at the the whole bell curve 
um, I, um, idea. It, it's not so much about everybody having to fit into the top part of the bell curve. It's about looking at children individually and, and setting up the learning environment that's based on their interests to pull them in. But then we work on the skills and, and individual development that needs to take place. And, and that then benefits not only the children, but the teachers and the educators as, and also the parents. And um, the reports that I've had in the classrooms that are implementing BrainSet is that everybody is so calm. And my mantra is a calm brain is a thinking brain. So if we can calm down the room, the teachers are saying that they now have time to talk to each other about how they can support the children, what they can do now and how they can add things to different spaces or take things away from different spaces. The children have time to be engaged in a non-threatening environment so they can communicate and build all of this, the self-regulation and resilience and lots of different negotiation skills. They're, all of their soft skills start to develop so they become um, you know, more confident and calmer. And then the parents see all this and then they go, oh, maybe we can implement some of these strategies at home. So behavior, behavior problems decrease, communication and uh, oral language increases because of the way we set up the, the learning environment. So one of my goals um, this coming year is to expand on that and to and to spread these ideas um, a little further. And, you know, we, we've made a good start um, as I said, I'm from Australia, but I'm currently in America We're doing just that. And so we've made a, a good start with that. And I think it's encompassing a lot of the, the things that have already been said. Um, now, to support that, I'm writing a book and so around brain set. So I'm about probably about two thirds of the way through that. And it's my birthday in uh, April. And I said to you before that I've been doing this for about 40 years. So in April, it's going to be a big birthday. And I'm really trying to get the book done and ready and to, to a publisher um, by, by April, mid-April. So that's one of my, my goals as well. So that's a big goal. And I'm, I'm plodding along and trying to pull all of that together. So I guess um, in a nutshell, Brainset is, is my goal for this coming year. And, and I think for a lot of years to come. That's going to be my my goal to spread the world, spread the word. And I agree with Claire when she's talking a lot about the play and the term I use is playful learning, because I think some people, as soon as they they hear that word play, they think, oh, it's just frivolous, nothing. It's a nothing stuff. Where we all know that play is the way children learn. So I call it playful learning, and that sort of softens the blow a little. I think for people who don't <laughs> who don't really understand how important play is. Um, so that's me. Yeah, and I think the book the book is that another you know, very beautiful touch to your goal setting, and uh, to you know it's it's amazing with what you've been working for forty years and putting that in a book and having that legacy shared with other researchers who know that this is what it is and this is how it is to be implemented, and uh, a very very nice thought on playful learning. And I feel when we talk about play way method, it is a kind of a non-stressful environment in which children can learn and we can provide them. So why make it stressful at three, you have to hold the pencil like that, at four, you need to sit like that, where you can just do that in a role play or probably just expose them and they become curious. And if it is a natural curiosity, they will come to the table without you telling them, go sit there because it's nine o'clock in the morning. That's right, Simran, and, and I have this other term that I call nat naturalistic assessment. So you can assess children's growth and development in a natural way. So when they're building with the blocks or whether they're doing a painting yeah. of their own volition, you can you can see, you know, what their skill level is like and how they yeah. can develop that. So it's, you know, naturalistic is the way to go. I, I feel playful learning and naturalistic assessment and brain set learning environments. So true. So wishing you all the best with your goal, Dr. Catherine. And Thank you, Simran. Uh, so can, uh, the floor is yours. All right. So hello, I was uh, hearing you, uh, everyone, and I was really happy that somehow my goals for 2023 are interconnected with yours. Uh, we'll come to Barsha. And of course, the vocational training is not enough. We need to inculcate the education. Especially when we talk about the diverse learners or neurodivergent, the best, the uh, let's say the 
bad part or worst part is that we think that they can't study. So I'm totally against that being an advocate of education. I would say that uh, we are going to launch our school readiness program. It's not just a therapy clinic. So my idea is to launch a school readiness program. So I would be really, I'm really blessed that I have a team which are really on for it. So from Monday onwards, we are going to include a little bit, uh, let's say starting with an hour of school readiness programs, we can include a little bit, bit by bit of academic, maybe numeracy, uh, sounds and uh, uh, including other parts like rhymes, even they are not repeating with us, even they are not vocal or verbal, but still the listening part is there. The music gives them the energy, right? And all the this academic part, or let's say the school readiness program, half an hour should be in the natural because environment, natural environment, because we believe that environment is a third teacher, right? So we cannot ignore the importance of the third teacher. So I think that's that's quite an achievable goal for me for 2023. Then again, with focus on my society and also the parenting training, the parental training is very, very important. We talk about society, but before that, we have to go towards parental training. Because again, they are in that denial mode. The acceptance is not there. So taking them to at the platform where they can take their children as a pride, not as a stigma or something which is threat for them while they are going out. So yes, the parenting training is very important to let them know that their hidden gems are their pride and they should proudly carry them anywhere and everywhere. After that, of course, uh, I would uh, love to have awareness session. I will, I, I'm doing my master's in education. I'm in the last month and I have my last semester. So after that, that's a weekend program. The Saturday, Sunday, I'm in my university. So I would uh, love to spare my Saturday for awareness sessions around the world. Of course, the Zoom or any online platform. So would love to have that. That's the third goal. That three objective and three goals for 2023. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akena, and easy to remember three adjectives and three goals, and we wish you all the best with that. Minakshi, thank you for waiting patiently for your turn. Over to you. Thank you, everybody. And, uh, you know, like everybody has said everything, whatever there was, uh, it was there in my mind, because yes, we all are educators. We are working for the betterment for the children. Yes, as a homemaker or individualized, we are working on ourselves or for the parents, like everything is there. But I would like to start, you know, that my personal goal would be to lose weight because I hogged on to a lot of pizza and burgers sitting back. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my first. But yes, uh, as Dr. Sue, Claire and uh, Dr. Catherine, Sukena, Barsha, Sh uh, Shamila, like everybody has said for the betterment of the children. A, yes, we have to um, give that knowledge. You know, we have to make the parents aware that stop labeling your children at such an early age. We need to, as an educators, we are, see, when, when I talk about as a teacher, I am not an expert. The child, me, I might be, you know, delayed in a milestone, but that child is not uh, there with the disability, you know, You're comparing children. We need to aware them that, okay, you need to stop comparing children. Our five fingers are also not, you know, like the same size. So we have to stop them to compare. Okay, this child is speaking so much. My child is not speaking. This child is understanding. My child is not understanding. Their levels, their mind levels, their mental levels are different. You and me are like different as well. Okay, so so these things we need to, you know, make them aware. Secondly, yes, environment plays in a very important role in uh, our day-to-day -day lives, in our lives also, and so so as in the child's life. So having that playful, uh, you know, method, the pedagogy, we need to make our pedagogy as such that, you know, the child is learning as well as, you know, the child is playing. The child, you know, like telling them study, 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 rather than changing the whole concept of that studying or making that concept, you know, to be understood by a child. So we have to be that innovators to change that thought process. Okay, 
So now we are telling one and one are two, but you know, they're just playing with the stones and now they are making like two. So that, that pedagogy, we need to be like, as educators, we need to bring it. We need to bring in like, how like, you know, like that, that we have Maria Montessori, we have Reggio. So like how we can amalgamate these two or we wardrobe, uh, we can, you know, amalgamate all these education, not we have to rigorously follow certain person, but how we can amalgamate all these things and, you know, bring it to our environment and to make the child learn. So that is something we need to, like, uh, we need to focus on, like I am focusing on, because I, as a pilot, I started something with, you know, um, involving a lot of uh, twigs and stones to my classroom, which was a hit. So this year, my this year, my resolution was to, you know, to get everything rather than fancy stuff, as Dr. Sue said. So uh, like, you know, so this year at the start, we I went for a holiday and came back and you won't believe from there, I picked up stones in my bag, the pine cones in my bag, just to get them back to my classroom. So a lot of lot of stuff you know to hands-on material because children are too much and parents are also like that okay don't get dirty don't play here the children do not know the concept of playing playing they only know the concept of okay i don't have to get dirty the clothes won't get, get dirty so the childhood gets lost in between so how to give that back to the children this is my personal goal this year that how i can you know bring all that stuff which we used to as children used to be, you know, like my parents were not even bothered that we are playing with water, with stone, with whatnot. So now as a personal goal, I want that to give that uh, to my children, to my learners. So that is what uh, I want to do this year. Thank you, everybody. Okay, you'll have to unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yes. Sorry. Very, very quickly. Can I just jump on that? Purcell, a brilliant advert called um, Free the Children. And it's about how much time children spend outside compared to prisoners. And prisoners spend more time outside these days than playing, well, outside, than our children do. And there's this great American guy who's like all wizened and old. And he says, you know, if you don't have to throw the kids in the bath at the end of the day, they haven't played hard enough. And we don't need to worry about filthy clothes. We need to throw them in the bath. That's what the bath is for. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Claire. And that's true because we are so overcautious. Or maybe we are just like going to be too tired at the end of the day to take care of it. Either of these reasons, we parents cite to ourselves. And he tells them, don't do this, don't do that. But yeah, great goal. Uh, sometimes these kind of things get missed. And I mean, actually, so many of us would be with you on your weight goal. But only thing is that you mentioned it. <laughs> and we did not. <laughs> so on, on that note, we move to our last segment. Um, and uh, we are right on time. So a quick 30 seconds to share any of our funny incidents, humorous learning, for last three years and if you don't have that you might as well just give one piece of quick advice for budding educators so uh, very quickly i go to dr sue anything that you want to add to conclude this segment uh, just that i learned that i could be a stand-up comedian because i have learned in the last year that if the technology all goes wrong or what's happening behind me on the screen isn't what i thought it was going to be I can still hold it. And I've even offered to tap dance in past <laughs> events, but I haven't. So for me, that's really important because I used to be really anxious that if I stumbled on my words, people would notice. If the screen didn't match what I was saying, people would notice. But when the whole screen collapses behind you in a big conference suite, you just have to get on with it, don't you? <laughs> True that. Thank you so much, Dr. Sue. Claire, over to you. Well, I was talking to one of my a researcher friend uh, just as the pandemic hit and we both had teenage boys who were 15 and we were sort of discussing how we're going to navigate this and the GCSEs and revision and all that jazz. And she said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to leave them on the computer games and they'll get bored and then they'll start their revision. OK, what I've discovered 
<laughs> they don't get bored, not for two years. <laughs> so, a bit of advice, if it happens again, not a good strategy. <laughs> yes, I was just about to, when you were saying this in these few seconds, I said, no, they don't. Yeah, they don't get bored. Of course not. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Catherine. Well, I've learned that when there's a pandemic and you don't drive your car very much, that the insurance policy premium reduces considerably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's quite a revolution. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Sakena. Sorry, Sakena. All right. So it's sort of like advice, I would say, and that's uh, sort of humorous as well. The I was there at my clinic and one of the child was, he's not verbal, right? He was continuously dragging me, dragging me, dragging me. We were trying to, uh, I mean, the speech therapist was trying to make him produce her sound, right? Her, her, we were trying since like two, three weeks and, you know, was suddenly said, come, come. It was like, come with me with the dragging part. And I told the parent, see, do not give up hope. So the, whenever there is a will, there is a way. That's it. Thank you. Superb. Thank you so much, Meenakshi. So last, from last uh, three years, I would, you know, I was trying to join the gym. I joined the gym. Pandemic happened again, <laughs> again. Lockdown happened. But this year, see consistency. So this year, I have joined, and I hope I lose some kilos. So this is the funny part. <laughs> Good one. Good one. You did not get your refund, though, Meenakshi. You could have blamed it on, did you get it? What, what, what? I said, did you get a refund from your gym? Because you no, I to told him, no, nah, I'm on a sabbatical, just move it again. <laughs> <laughs> Great, awesome. Thank you, Minakshi, and all the best to you with that. Shamila. So good to listen to all the different uh, pieces of advice and definitely going to keep that one in mind, Minakshi, for the gym. <laughs> So mine is, I always say, and something that I said in my last meeting with my staff is perfectionism is so 2019. We're so over perfectionism. It's, it's, we choose what matters and mark the rest that it's done. And it's better than perfect. So perfectionism, out. Wow, superb. Thank you so much, Shamila. Barsha? Thank you, Simran. You know, very quickly, uh, you know, the moment pandemic hit, I was I was transitioning from the corporate world, you know, from strategy consulting. And, you know, there were everyday board meetings that we had. Uh, the first thing that, you know, when pandemic hit and everything went on Zoom, uh, my I have two millennial daughters, you know. So the first thing she said, isn't it better you can, pe uh, you know, mute people at will? <laughs> I said, OK. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so sometimes mute and unmute actually works very well in life. <laughs> Amazingly well. And uh, I think this reminds me, Varsha, uh, my daughter, when this whole thing happened uh, and these children were meeting online, okay, there would be so much of a fight on who would be the host because the host gets to the mute and unmute. And, you know, it was amusing when I used to go and, and, uh, Three years back when she was now at, the, at 10, I call her pre-teens and almost teens. But when she was seven or six, she would come to the webinar and ask, do you, are you the host? Can you mute? <laughs> really, is that your cat? <laughs> well, yes. So on a humorous note where we all are smiling, thank you very, very much for your time. And I hope our viewers uh, everyone watching out there or you will be watching this on YouTube maybe a few days later and whenever you visit this recording you uh, carry this beautiful smile with you also we had a wonderful time sharing our thoughts and hopefully one of the goals for us in this forum would be to meet in three months hopefully personally uh, while ECDF is planning something interesting and we take these smiles forward and thank you once again to each one of you for giving your time and sharing your ideas. And uh, I will end this with a very nice um, Instagram post that I saw on uh, the New Year's Day. Uh, last year, you worked on being strong. Me, this year, you work on being happy. So here is to happiness and here is to the smile and here is to the cheers. 
Thank you very, very much. And have a lovely evening and the rest of the weekend, whatever is left. Thanks a lot. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.